Hey everybody and welcome back to NeuroPsyQ. Today we are thrilled to welcome good friend and fellow NeuroPsyQ viewer Yana Simokova to the channel to share with us some basics on brain metabolism. So today is another NeuroPsyQ Neuroscience ABCs lecture and today is B for brain metabolism. Hope you enjoy! Hi everyone, my name is Jana Semakova and I'm going to explain you now some basics on brain energy metabolism. So let's start with some hard facts. Although the human brain makes up only 2% of human body weight, it consumes 20% of body energy as well as 25% of circulating glucose. In my presentation, I will try to answer following questions. Why is the brain so expensive? Where the brain energy comes from? Does the brain eat glucose only? What are the alternative substrates? And what we still don't know? So our first question would be, why is our brain so expensive? In one of previous NeuroPsyQ episodes, you have heard about action potential. To make long story short, a neuron responding to a signal from another neuron opens its ion channels located on an axon membrane, leading to influx of sodium as well as efflux of potassium. When the action potential reaches the end of the axon terminal, synaptic vesicles release neurotransmitters to cross the synaptic gap to evoke the action potential on a downstream neuron. That's nice, but... Who will clean it up and who will pay for it? If you look into some neuroscience textbook, you will find that the membrane protein called sodium-potassium ATPase maintains cell polarity of neurons. So, in other words, that's the one who will clean up the sodium ions outside and the potassium ions inside the cell. But, as we can see, it is not for free. To get two potassium ions into the cell, while getting rid of three sodium ions, we have to pay with one ATP molecule. So, how the neurons get ATP, or where the usable energy comes from? Maybe you remember from your biochemistry lectures an evolutionary ancient metabolic pathway called glycolysis. Glycolysis is a series of 10 reactions localized in cytosol, which produces quickly relatively small amounts of ATP. A substrate for this pathway is glucose, means six carbons. The products are two pyruvate molecules, means two times three carbons. A pyruvate could be converted to lactate or enter mitochondria, a real power plant for majority of human cells. The combination of mitochondrial metabolic pathways called tricarboxylic acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation in the presence of enough oxygen provides plenty of ATP molecule. So we have to eat to have glucose, and breathe to have oxygen, and of course, we need functional metabolic pathways. On a previous slide, we have seen how individual cell gets the energy from glucose molecule. This diagram is in some way pretty obvious. However, it is always good to know exactly step by step the processes, which are intuitively easy. So our human here eats some carbohydrates in food, such as bread or pizza. The carbohydrates we eat are polymers composed of glucose molecules. These long molecules are digested within our gastrointestinal tract and separated glucose molecules are absorbed to blood. 
the excess of glucose is then stored within the liver, which, together with pancreas and other endocrine organs, maintains steady blood glucose level. The glucose is then transported to brain by blood vessels. An interesting point on brain circulation is the existence of blood-brain barrier. To be able to cross it, the glucose is uptaken by a membrane protein called GLUT1 transporter. So the glucose molecule is within a brain. And what about the oxygen? It is quite easy as oxygen passes the blood-brain barrier by diffusion. Except glucose, there are also some alternative substrates able to cross the blood-brain barrier. In adult brain, these are used mainly in specific situations like starvation or when on ketogenic diet. A membrane protein called MCT1 is able to transport ketone bodies as well as lactate into human brain. There are also some very alternative substrates which normally do not occur in our food. However, they could be synthesized and administered as nutritional therapy under special circumstances. Among them, the one most interesting metabolically is called triheptanoin. And we are coming to our final slide today, trying to illustrate what exactly happens with glucose within the brain. To be honest, literally exactly, nobody knows. However, we have findings, theories and hypotheses. As you have heard in previous issues of this channel, there are many different cells within the human brain. For our metabolic story here, we can simplify it just to neurons, astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. The difficult issue for metabolic research is that they are very close to each other, making it impossible to extract just neurons or just astrocytes from a given region. If you do metabolic research on yeasts or even human liver, it is quite easy, you just have to smash as many cells as you need together and do your analysis. But if you smash a brain tissue, you lose the majority of information because you do not know what belongs to neurons or neural processes and what are astrocytes, what are oligodendrocytes. Some 20 years ago, brain metabolic scientists tried to overcome this issue studying pure cultures of neurons and astrocytes. Interestingly, neurons metabolized preferentially lactate, while astrocytes metabolized preferentially glucose and the lactate was expelled from cells into the cultural media. These observations led to formulation of lactate shuttle hypothesis. Uh, glucose from blood is uptaken by astrocyte, goes through glycolysis, the pyruvate is converted into lactate, and lactate is then transported to neuron. Within neuron, it is converted to pyruvate, uptaken by mitochondria, and driven through TCA and OXFOS. However, since that time, there are many other experimental data showing that it is not so clear whether this really happens in brain tissue. Maybe astrocytes use the pyruvate themselves and neurons uptake the glucose and use it for energy production. There is also a possibility that lactate produced by astrocytes is uptaken by oligodendrocytes and then transported to neuronal axons to get enough ATP to maintain membrane potential. It is of course possible 
that all those processes occur sometimes somewhere in the brain. So let's be patient and see what the future brings us. And have a nice year 2020. Bye! That's all for today. We hope you enjoyed. Special thanks to Yana for creating this video and thank you all for coming back and watching every week. Make sure you leave us a thumbs up, comment, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. We hope to see you next week to keep increasing your neuropsych.